So uh, yeah, I was uh, I was attending the earlier sessions and I did not know this was a separate session because I was like, well, okay, I'll be done for today. Uh, maybe people are tired. So, all right, so thank you. I want to thank the organizers of QIQT for the opportunity to uh, speak here today. Uh, and uh, particularly Prashanta, who uh, I enjoyed very much uh, interacting with uh, last year as well and, and, and uh, uh, this year too. Uh, so uh, I am at IUPUI, which is a joint campus of Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. And uh, I have a theory group where uh, uh, we try to uh, build upon simple models, uh, which give interesting insights. And today I will be focusing on uh, so-called non-Hermitian open systems. And these systems with their exceptional point degeneracies have become extremely popular in the last uh, maybe a decade or so. Initially they became popular on the classical front and now they have been sort of extended into the quantum domain. And I will primarily talk about our work uh, on these systems in the quantum domain. Uh, uh, this is a work which is uh, supported by Office of Naval Research, IUPUI, and uh, the work that I will talk about, uh, my experimental collaborator on that uh, work is Cater Murchis Group at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Okay. Also, uh, please feel free to uh, interrupt if you have questions, uh, basically, and uh, yeah. All right, so this is the outline of my talk. Uh, and uh, I just want people to take away the main messages from here. If you have questions or uh, sort of, you know, connect with me later, I am happy to do that in terms of discussing details or if people have other uh, sort of, you know, um, ideas or uh, things that they want to uh, talk about. All right, so the outline of my talk is initially, I will tell a little bit about what I mean by non-hermeticity in the quantum uh, domain. Uh, and this will start by first discussing how quantum systems which are dissipative are described. After that, I will connect this non-hermeticity ideas to a brief review of uh, PT symmetry, which is the sort of topic uh, from which this exploration of non-Hermitian Hamiltonians started uh, about 20 to 25 years ago. And then I will focus on a particular platform, which is uh, basically a superconducting qubit or a superconducting transmon rather, uh, which has multiple energy levels uh, and how we can implement non-hermeticity uh, in such a system through post-selection. Uh, I will then discuss our results which are exploring this kind of a coherent non-unitary dynamics that occurs in such systems and how it is different from uh, the Hermitian dynamics uh, that we are very much familiar with in quantum systems, in particular, in regards to quantum computing, where you really want sort of, you know, unitary quantum simulators, uh, simulators which are as close to the unitary evolution as, as possible. And I'll end with an outlook. Uh, okay. And uh, on this slide, I show, uh, this is a slide from a Nature Physics cartoon from 2015. Uh, where uh, it was discussing what were sort of, you know, the interesting discoveries in the, in the past 10 years from 2005 to 2015. And one of the things that showed up in here on the top right-hand corner you see is uh, parity time symmetry in optics that was sort of the introduction of non-Hermitian Hamiltonians uh, with gain and loss uh, into experiments in the classical domain. So this subject on the classical front is, is fairly old uh, but on the quantum front, it has sort of developed in the last maybe three years. And that's the interesting stuff that I want to tell you about uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes, okay? All right, so uh, let me start this, sort of set the stage by starting out with a very simple uh, equation, which is uh, uh, what is the equation of motion for quantum systems, okay? And I'm going to start out with this sort of a general uh, formalism where it's a first order in time linear differential equation. Uh, it could be nonlinear if it is representing some effective model as we'll talk about. But in general, the equation that you are familiar with, the Schrodinger equation, if you wish, uh, is of the form uh, I times time derivative of some object A is equal to some object B times some object A. Uh, in the Schrodinger equation form, uh, this A stands for either the state vector that you have, basically, you know, psi, 
uh, or it stands for the time evolution operator, which also satisfies the same equation. So the propagator, as you would call it, basically. And in the Schrodinger equation for closed uh, quantum systems, uh, the term B here really represents a Hermitian Hamiltonian, which could be time dependent or could be static, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the result of that, as we learn in standard quantum theory, uh, is that if that's the case, then uh, the time evolution operator that comes about from that, or the propagator that is generated is unitary. And what that means, uh, is that the norm of a state is conserved as well as the inner product between states is conserved, basically. Right? And so in this case, uh, B is your typical, uh, you know, Hermitian Hamiltonian for a system. This could be continuum Hamiltonian. This could be a discrete degrees of freedom like a single qubit. Uh, it doesn't really matter. This is a general uh, formalism. And then uh, the, the, when you have B as a Hamiltonian, then even though it might have degeneracies, uh, those degeneracies are accompanied by a set of orthogonal eigenvectors. And so the degeneracies of B are what we call level crossings, or they might correspond to phase transitions in some other sort of you know, context, basically. Okay. So that's a general property. These are all everybody's familiar with. I just want to sort of uh, cast all the discussion that is going forward in uh, this general terms. Uh, now, going a little bit ahead, if we think about quantum systems, which are coupled to an environment, so now we are thinking about not uh, really isolated quantum system, but a quantum system which is coupled to a large bath, which uh, introduces decoherence, uh, then uh, that dynamics are described by what is called Lindlar equation. Okay. And this Lindlar equation uh, can also be written in this following form, a linear differential equation where it is linear in the density matrix. So in that case, A will stand uh, for uh, the density matrix, uh, basically, uh, in the Lindlar evolution. Uh, I have a question. Are you guys able to see my, uh, my mouse or the pointer? Uh, yes, we are able to see. Okay, all right, so I don't need another one. I can basically uh, just use that. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, looks like in the chat, there is some questions. No, all right, very good. Okay, so uh, in that case, my uh, A, this uh, quantity A in this equation uh, will basically correspond to uh, the density matrix uh, for the quantum system. And uh, in this language, the, the operator B uh, will be what is called Lindlar super operator because uh, the equation is still linear in the density matrix. It can be vectorized and written into some kind of a linear differential equation. So in that language, B will be a non-Hermitian uh, Lindlar super operator. And we need to tack on an extra piece of I because we added an extra piece of I here on the left-hand side just to make it all look similar uh, in the context of uh, of, of equations of motion, okay? All right. And in this case, we will have degeneracies for this matrix B. And those degeneracies of the Lindard super operator, well, those degeneracies basically correspond to uh, what are called critically damped modes, because in this Lindard evolution, uh, the, the matrix B has eigenvalues, which basically give you decay to the steady state uh, for the equation. The, a quantum system, when coupled to an environment, is going to reach a steady state. It is going to decohere. And so it is going to have decay of the coherences. And uh, so in this language, the degeneracies of this matrix B are quite different than the degeneracies of the matrix B when we consider Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, now I have a question mark next to it here, and I won't get time to talk about it most likely, but the basic idea is whether this equation of motion is accurate to begin with or not. And it turns out that under certain circumstances, which is what we will focus on, uh, it is accurate. Although if you want to be really accurate, sort of, no. Uh, if you really want to be uh, specific about it, then, then uh, there are correction terms here which arise from noise. Uh, in the operator language, okay. Uh, all right, there is a question which says, can the density matrix also be non-Hermitian? And I think uh, I am only considering uh, sort of, you know, so short answer is uh, no. And by that, I mean the following. Uh, 
I am considering only models which are uh, in models in which sort of, you know, the norm is defined by the Dirac norm. So the inner product is something that is given to us by nature because that's how nature seems to behave. So I am not going to consider left, right, you know, products or density matrices, which are consisting of left, right eigenvectors and things like that, which is all very good mathematical explorations, but it's very hard to make connection to experiments. Okay. All right. Uh, so the question that I want to, starting from this, as a basic definition of quantum systems, I want to explore and tell you what happens if B matrix is non-Hermitian. So I wanna tell you what happens if B is non-Hermitian, how do you make it non-Hermitian, and then what are the consequences of it in a particular platform uh, of a minimal quantum system uh, called superconducting qubit platform, okay? All right. So now the question, the, the, the next question that I want to sort of address or, uh, you know, uh, give you information about is what is meant by uh, a non-Hermitian B in the time evolution that we are thinking about. So the so when I talk about a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, what do I mean by that? So the consequences of it are that I'm looking at coherent non-unitary evolution, which is generated by such a Hamiltonian. So in other words, we are not necessarily considering just Lindblad dynamics, which is very well understood, okay? Right. Uh, when you have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, then the eigenvalues of those Hamiltonian in general is what we call energies. And if the Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian, then you will get complex energies. Okay. And complex energies essentially form Riemann surfaces. And when you have intersections of these Riemann surfaces, which are degeneracies of these complex energies, uh, then those are branch points. And we learned about this in complex analysis, you know, uh, that uh, they have interesting topological structure. Uh, now I should, so one of the sort of demonstrations of this, which is shown here, uh, is basically the degeneracies of uh, these complex energies are called exceptional points or EPs, okay? Right. And they differ fundamentally from degeneracies of Hermitian Hamiltonians in the following way. Uh, this picture on the top here, panel A, which is from an article by uh, Vijay Chen uh, a while ago, uh, shows the band structure near a degeneracy of a Hermitian Hamiltonian. So these two are sort of, you know, two bands or two uh, surfaces, uh, energy manifolds, if you wish. Uh, they meet at this point down here. And then as a function of the perturbation epsilon from that point, the mode splitting delta omega, which is on the vertical axis that will arise, you can see in this picture, it's basically linear. This is just saying that if I, if I sit at a Hermitian degeneracy and perturb it a little bit, then to first order, uh, unless there are symmetric considerations, the mode splitting that I generate uh, will be proportional uh, to my perturbation epsilon, okay? So 1% mode splitting or 1% perturbation gives me 1% mode splitting, basically. If epsilon is 10 raised to minus two, delta omega will be in dimensionless units 10 raised to minus two. On the other hand, if I look at the degeneracies of complex Hamiltonians, basically, uh, or non-Hermitian Hamiltonians uh, in general, basically, uh, then the, the energy level structure looks like this panel B down here, okay? Right. Uh, so the degeneracies arise where you have the real parts of the energies coming up together and meeting in some kind of a square root fashion. And this is a generic result, which means that if I look at the cut of this away from this point, uh, this is the square root behavior cut is what you find. And so the mode splitting delta omega at the exceptional point that you get is not going to be proportional to epsilon. In fact, it is going to be proportional to epsilon to the power half. Okay. Now, this is interesting from sensing point of view because this means now when I have a 1% perturbation, I am going to get a 10% mode splitting. And this effect, you know, 1% perturbation, 1% mode splitting versus 1% perturbation and 10% mode splitting because that's the square root of 1%. Uh, this is what has been a source of great interest in classical systems uh, to try and take systems or uh, sort of arrange such that your systems reach exceptional point and then see what happens in the vicinity of these non-Hermitian degeneracies, okay? 
All right, so now what I want to tell you is I mentioned here that non-Hermitian sort of Hamiltonians for wave systems are well understood. So I wanna tell you how this equation of motion B, non-Hermitian B arises in classical system. And let me remind you, you can think about this word B effectively as a Hamiltonian in the equations of motion basically. All right, so the story of this, how does a complex B or a non-Hermitian B arise in classical domain? This one goes back actually uh, long ago, and this is like a one slide story or summary of that story, okay? So I'm going to go over it quickly. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer in detail. But the story basically started from uh, mainly Carl Bender, although there were a few others, but Carl Bender and his collaborators uh, who started studying uh, the spectra of continuum Hamiltonians, which are defined by this edge in the blue here, okay? So it has a kinetic energy term, which you are very familiar with. This is where h bar squared over 2m is equal to 1. So we are just studying a non-relativistic single particle on a line, okay? And then you have a potential term, which is x squared times ix to the power epsilon, okay? Now, this is uh, interesting, and by interesting, what I mean is that uh, this is kind of a potential where, you know, uh, what motivated this was that early numerical calculations have shown that this seems to have real eigenvalues. And indeed, what is shown in the background here is the energy spectra calculated by Carl and, and his uh, student, Stefan Botcher, uh, as a function of epsilon, basically, which are numerically calculated spectra. So if epsilon is zero, then this is your favorite simple harmonic oscillator. And so you get energy levels, which are dimensionless as one, three, five, seven, nine. These are equally spaced energy levels here, okay? What was a surprise was that even when epsilon is one, which corresponds to a potential, which is given by I times X cubed, this is not a potential you would generally think about. You would see, well, okay, that's a purely imaginary potential. What does that mean? But at least if you went around and calculated the spectrum, what you found was it was a bounded below spectrum with you know, purely real eigenvalues, okay? And uh, Carl and, uh, and, and, and his uh, sort of coworkers did not just stop there. What they found was that this was a generic phenomenon that they found. They found that whenever they considered models which had a Hermitian PT symmetric kinetic energy term, and here P and T stand for the antilinear operator of, you know, basically time reversal and parity defined in some suitable way, okay? But what is really important is just that you have this term to be symmetric or commute with some antilinear operator, okay? All right, so they found that you had a Hermitian kinetic energy term, you had a non-Hermitian PT symmetric potential energy term. That's why they only considered functions which are functions of the combination I times X, which is a combination which is invariant under the combined operation of parity and time reversal. Under time reversal, x goes to minus, well, under parity, uh, x goes to minus x, basically. Under time reversal, uh, it's antilinear, so i goes to minus i, and the combination ix remains the same, okay? Uh, and what they found was that this spectra remained real for epsilon positive and for epsilon negative, uh, if some of the eigenvalues were real, but the rest were complex conjugate pairs. And uh, this sort of a transition from uh, real eigenvalues to complex conjugate eigenvalues showed up every time you considered Hamiltonians, which were, uh, which were PT symmetric or Hamiltonians, which sort of com you know, commuted with some antilinear operator, basically. And now the calculation of this is actually quite uh, non-trivial because you're solving a differential uh, equation or a eigenvalue problem with this complex potential and so on and so forth. But all of these features are at least the key fundamental features are actually valid even in this simple two by two example that I have written below. So instead of this complicated edge, let me consider an edge which is just a particle in a magnetic field if you wish, uh, or a two by two matrix. And the two by two matrix has a term which is J sigma X. So that's just a rabbi drive. You could have two wells and the particle hopping back and forth. That basically model or that system would be modeled by J sigma X, uh, where sigma X is the X Pauli matrix. And then you added up some non-Hermitian or anti-Hermitian term, which is I gamma times sigma Z over two, okay? Right. 
And here the capital gamma is a positive, is a real quantity basically. So now this one is like a two by two matrix uh, with a real magnetic field along the X axis. And if you wish an imaginary magnetic field along the Z axis, uh, there are, so this is a two by two model, everybody can solve it. The eigenvalues are indeed given by the norm or the length of the, of the magnetic field, which would be square root of J squared minus this quantity. And so you can imagine that, or sort of you can see very clearly that uh, these eigenvalues become degen. They have a square root structure that I mentioned earlier, this kind of a square root behavior structure that I had shown earlier. Uh, they have a square root structure. Uh, these eigenvalues become degenerate when J is equal to gamma over two, or in other words, the Hermitian strength equals the non-Hermitian strength, basically, or anti-Hermitian strength, okay? Uh, and if you actually calculate the rank of H, then you find that rank of H is two everywhere except for at the point when gamma is equal to J. At that point, H actually becomes, you know, rank one matrix. And that's the exceptional point. In this case, the exceptional point is that gamma equals two J. Okay. So there was a lot of this math, which was done from 1980s throughout 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, but there was never a clear understanding of what does it mean? How do you make it? You know, what is a potential of Ix mean basically? Okay, and how could you even realize it? And this was a breakthrough by uh, Christodulides, basically, Demetrius Christodulides. And what he realized was that actually Schrodinger equation is the same as Maxwell's equation in paraxial approximation for light, which is propagating, for example, in an array of evanescently coupled waveguides. Uh, and such array of evanescently coupled waveguides had been used for many years to actually simulate how sort of, you know, quantum behavior of a particle hopping on a lattice in a unitary limit, okay? But what he, uh, what, what uh, Dimitri realized, uh, sort of observed was that uh, in this equivalence, the role that is played by the potential is actually given by index of refraction of the waveguide material, or more specifically, it's the index contrast in the small index contrast limit, uh, index contrast between sort of the, the core and the cladding, okay? And they knew that this index of refraction, as we are very familiar with, is actually complex because you have some real index of refraction, but then material also absorbs. And so the index of refraction, when you calculate the frequency dependent, for example, you know, dielectric constant or corresponding index of refraction, then that one has an imaginary part. And then the imaginary part basically represents absorption. The fact that light gets absorbed as it propagates in a material basically. Okay. And so this really opened the floodgates of understanding that a model like IX, if I have a potential like Ix, then whenever X is negative, this represents absorption. And whenever X is positive, this represents amplification or gain, basically. That corresponds to positive part of the imaginary index of refraction, basically, okay? Uh, so what Demetrius really had the insight to, to sort of say was that actually these PT models with these imaginary potentials are effective models for classical systems where you have balanced gain and loss. Uh, and really the parity time symmetry basically says, if I have some loss in this part, then at its mirror symmetric part, I should have equivalent amount of gain. And in this case, uh, of course, because it's a non, it's sort of a system which has gain and loss, the evolution which is generated by such a Hamiltonian will not be unitary because it's an effective model the amount of stuff in the system is going to change, but the system still undergoes a transition called PT transition, where it goes from being in quasi equilibrium to a system which is far removed from equilibrium. And once this idea was clear, then uh, floodgates of this sort of non-Hermitian Hamiltonian experiments opened. So these have been realized in optics, uh, in electrical circuits, in ultra cold atoms, in, you know, semiconductor lasers, which are coupled. Some of these, I have been involved in, some of these were early pioneers, which sort of, you know, are even in mechanical oscillators, in fact. So in other words, basically just two pendula, real life pendula, one with a damping and another with a pumping, which are coupled to each other. And all of these under appropriate sort of mapping, reduce down to 
a model which is described by i delta t of something is equal to b times something where the b is a non hermitian matrix okay and the something is usually uh, the the vector which describes the state of the system basically you can call it a state vector even though this is a classical system or not whatever but in the end it's sort of a system which whose time evolution operator or who generator of time evolution is not hermitian okay so this was all sort of understood and this has been happening since like i think this was a paper from 2010 which was one of the first papers to do pt symmetry in, in in optics and so on and so since then there has been a flood of experiments and things like that on this topic and the key insight in this is really what sort of to some extent crystal lights data which was that you take a system uh, maybe a pendulum which is damped and if i look at it x and t form then it will have this sort of a uh, damped behavior and that would be a lossy system and now you take this system and look at its time reverse version uh, so in this case uh, you know as a function of time the, the 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 amplitude for example or the momenta are increasing with time basically okay uh, and uh, when i couple these two systems together basically then at finite coupling uh, this system is stabilized and by that i mean instead of being amplified or instead of being instead of being lossy or instead of being any uh, the system does have basically a stabilized behavior where it leads to uh, sort of oscillatory behavior okay so instead of just having exponential decay with oscillations or exponential growth uh, now you have a system which has a time translational symmetry restored because it is giving rise to periodic behavior okay uh, i see there is a question about sort of you know quasi hermitian stuff and things like that uh, and i will so i will address this question in the uh, in the question time because it will take us off of what i want to focus on uh, at the heart of it uh, all models which are quasi hermitian where you have sort of matrices which don't look hermitian but have real eigen vector values and are self adjoint under some you know, other in a product uh, i am not considering those models mainly because those models are not a sort of you know they may be mapped onto a effectively hermitian model although that might lead to you know uh, not long range interactions and things like that and more importantly Uh, nature seems to behave according to a specific inner product when it comes to born approximation and so nature only behaves according to dirac inner product as far as all experiments are concerned and therefore i am not going to sort of think about the systems where uh, you could redefine a new inner product which is positive definite and develop a self consistent unitary quantum theory which is what a large part of the body of the work that was done in the sort of late 90s and early 2000s okay uh all right uh very good so this uh so so now the question is you know if you think about pt systems as or non hermitian systems as coupling this to time reverse system one of the main questions is can we do all of this in quantum platforms classical platforms all of this has been sort of you know uh well understood has been explored significantly and so with quantum platforms there are issues and that's what i want to focus on first uh, before going to how do we address those issues or how do we overcome those issues okay right uh <laughs> all right uh so the the, the first uh, so let me sort of go over what would be the time evolution or what would be the properties uh to get pt in the quantum domain so just to remind you uh, the time evolution operator uh, or the time dynamics of a system which is evolving according to some pt symmetric hamiltonian uh, is just given here basically you know psi of t is the time evolution operator times psi zero and if the, the 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 time evolution operator or if the hamiltonian is time dependent then this exponential would be replaced by some time order product that we understand and know how to do uh, and because this is not a unitary operator uh the norm of the state will not be same as the norm of the state at time t equals 0 or said another way uh, the time evolution operator basically the propagator will not be unitary okay all right uh now the question is okay how do we do this uh can we really do this at a quantum level okay 
Now, uh, the first natural candidate is optics, because for optics, PT has been done in the classical domain. And so you could ask, well, can I get it down to quantum domain? And the answer is no. Uh, the, 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 the heart of the matter is really that the loss term that you get is linear down to quantum level, to single photon level. But when you think about gain, basically, or if you think about what are the limits that come on the noise that is produced, when you have an amplification of a mode, if you think about a quantum amplifier, then basically that precludes having balanced Lenin gauss all the way down to essentially quantum level. Another way to say this is that if I want to think about a gain, then I, in general, in the gain process, I have two processes. One is a stimulated emission part and another one is spontaneous emission part. And the stimulated emission part is what basically dominates in classical platforms. And so the spontaneous emission part, which is random, uh, you ignore it when you are comparing this gain to the loss. But uh, when you are down to few photon numbers, it cannot be done. Uh, there are other methods to sort of stimulate, simulate this kind of PT Hamiltonian via embedding this non-unitary evolution into a larger unitary. Uh, this can be done most easily uh, in platforms where you have access to dialing a unitary or sort of you know dialing any arbitrary unitary that you want, uh, as in photonic chips using KLM scheme or REC scheme. Uh, there are other possibilities where you are only looking at loss-only Hamiltonians uh, in sort of semi-classical systems such as ultra-cold atoms. So maybe you have uh, you know, ultra-cold atoms in a trap that are degenerate and only one of those levels you are going to introduce, which is macroscopically occupied by a large number of you know, ultra-cold atoms, you introduce loss uh, by, by kicking them out of the trap and things like that. Uh, or it is also possible to sort of take this non-unitary operator and carry out some kind of singular value decomposition and then implement that using squeezing and KLM or REC scheme. Okay. So these are all sort of options that we have looked at uh, across multiple platforms. And today I only want to focus on one platform, uh, which is uh, a platform where we are using superconducting uh, transmon or a superconducting device with discrete energy levels, basically. Okay. So we are using a prototypical qubit, or at least one candidate for a prototypical artificial qubit, basically. Okay. And what I want to tell you is how to use post selection to obtain non Hermitian Hamiltonian. And then what are the consequences of it once you have access to such a non Hermitian Hamiltonian in a minimal quantum system? Okay. Basically. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears and for the rest of the talk, which is probably, I guess, about uh, half of the, you know, I, I have reached about half of my talk. So for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about this one particular platform only. And I'll tell you what all kind of things we can do with this platform, uh, uh, which is a well understood, uh, well known open quantum system. Okay. All right, so the platform that we are considering uh, is a, superconducting junction uh, or superconducting transmon, basically. Uh, these are all uh, work done with Kater Murch's lab who has this experimental uh, platform. And so to first approximation, it's basically a nonlinear LC circuit, this superconducting qubit, uh, or not qubit, but a transmon. And uh, it has multiple energy levels that you can sort of have depending on you know, how you are uh, tuning it. So typically this, uh, looking at panel E, typically the energy level structure of such a circuit is going to be, there will be a ground state called G. There will be the first excited state called E, and there is a second excited state called F. Uh, this junction is in a cavity, which is dispersively coupled. And because of that, the level spacing <laughs> between uh, sort of G and E and E and F are all different. And because of that, these are really levels, I want to emphasize, these are not modes, these are minimal quantum levels, basically. Okay. Uh, now, these can be coupled, uh, these individual levels can be sort of coupled or transitioned by applying a rabbi drive of a particular frequency. And because these are not, you know, equidistant, uh, you will be able to just couple le levels G and E without having any transitions between E and F. 
That is what would happen if you had modes where these are levels which are equidistant from each other, basically. Okay. Uh, now, of course, uh, this is a circuit which is. <coughs> hmm. uh, this is a circuit which has a loss. Well, these are levels, and this is a circuit which is coupled to a cavity, which means that there will be, because of quantum fluctuations, or coupling to the system, there will be dissipation. And there will be various channels of dissipation that this three level uh, system will have. Uh, the prominent channels of dissipation are where spontaneous emission E goes to the ground state, or you can spontaneously decay from level F to the E state. And this is what gamma E and gamma F are. In a naturally occurring atom in vacuum, these decay rates are fixed. And that's why this artificial atom system is uh, sort of, you know, much preferred because in that case, you can control these energy levels as well as you can control the decay rates for these energy levels, basically. Okay. So if I look at this entire three level system, its dynamics are actually described by so-called Lindblad equation, which is given here, which says that the time derivative of the density matrix would be some coherent evolution of this density matrix with an H naught, which will consider contain all the Hermitian Hamiltonians, the rabbi drives, the detunings, and all of those things that you can apply, okay? In addition, uh, there will be a decohering piece for this Lindblad, which is given traditionally in this particular form, where Ls are called basically the, the dissipators, okay? And the gammas are the strengths of those dissipators, okay? And I have written this in this particular form because uh, there should be a negative sign here. Uh, my apologies, this should not be positive. It should be a negative sign here, which makes sure that this equation gives rise to a completely positive trace preserving map. And the trace preserving part is ensured by a negative sign in here, okay? All right, so uh, you have a anti-commutator term with the density matrix, and then you have this term, which is in a blue circle, which is called the quantum jump term, basically, okay? All right, if I take this entire evolution, it's a trace preserving evolution, which basically brings this three level system, no matter where you start, to the ground state. And that just means that if I have an atom which is excited, it will decay. This is all well known, basically, okay, all right. But here is what is non-trivial. If I am able to ignore these terms, basically, if I'm able to ignore these terms, or in other words, if I only post select in the trajectories or the quantum trajectories of this Q trait, such that starting with one of these manifolds, starting with one of these two levels, the system is only always found in level F or E. If I only take that data set, then that corresponds to ignoring the effects of this last term. Okay. And if the effects of the last term are ignored, then this evolution that is shown here, the one with the H naught and the gammas, is an evolution according to a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian which is given by H naught minus I times gamma times L dagger L, okay? So in other words, if I take the entire density matrix and its statistics, then of course everything decays and the system will just come down to ground state. But because I have access to the sort of, you know, the occupation of the system at every instance of time, I can do tomography at every instance of time. If I only take the data set, such that the system is found in this submanifold of F and E, then that is what we call post-selection, okay? And as long as the system is not decayed to the ground state, as long as it's only in this submanifold, the dynamics in this submanifold are governed by a purely non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. And in fact, the post-selection part, which actually leads to also normalization of the density matrix. So post-selection is not just dropping this term, it's the, dropping this term plus adding some nonlinear term in the density matrix to ensure that the trace is preserved. Operationally, post-selection leads you to a dynamics which is consistent with a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian in a minimal quantum system, a system which has just two levels. This is not approximate, this is not also applicable to classical, or this is not applicable to modes, this is applicable to quantum levels. Okay. And so once you have this insight, which is what we sort of you know, realized, uh, then you have access to a minimal quantum system, which undergoes coherent 
non-unitary dynamics that is generated by a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay. And this is very exciting because before this, all of the stuff, the, all of the interesting things that were with non-Hermitian Hamiltonians were being done in classical models, you know, wave models. You have optics, you have acoustics, you have electrical circuits, you have, you know, pendula, all of these things. But this is a, a genuine minimal quantum system and it's undergoing essentially, uh, you know, dynamics, which is coherent, but it is not unitary. So this is sort of like the way it's, one of the ways I have heard it described is this is a atom, it's a decaying atom which does not decay. And if you only look at that atom when it has not decayed, then its behavior is very different basically from an atom which is not coupled to an environment at all basically. So once we had this idea, then uh, because it's a artificial uh, atom, we are able to actually tune these two decay rates and so in particular, it's possible to tune the decay rate such that the decay from level F to E is much smaller than the decay rate from level E to G. In an experiment, this decay rate is 10 times larger than this decay rate. Okay. And so then you are really able to get a honest uh, non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, it will have complex energies. Now for the purposes of this experiment, it's easy to fix the value of gamma. It's easy to fix the non-Hermitian part and to vary the Hermitian part J, or when you are applying this rabbi drive, if you apply it off resonance, then that also gives you a term which is some detuning times sigma Z term basically. So in other words, we are able to sort of span this entire space of delta, which is the detuning axis, and this axis which is underneath is basically J axis. And you get some you know, complex energy surfaces along with exceptional points and everything else that some of which had been explored in the <coughs> classical systems we are able to get here. But we can go further than that because in this case, this is a qubit, which means its states are accessible and its complex states over the entire block sphere are something that are physical, tangible objects. So in particular, one of the things we can do is to look at the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, the effective Hamiltonian that generates after dropping this off and look at what's the angle between the eigenstates of this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. So like I mentioned before, if I, just to be sort of clear, this model over here is the same model that describes this qubit once it is post-selected. So J sigma X and gamma times sigma Z, okay? And what happens as you change the J for a fixed gamma is that basically, uh, in, the, in the limit when gamma is zero or J is zero, uh, these eigenstates are perpendicular to each other. So their inner product is zero. But on the other hand, when you approach the exceptional point, when you approach this point where the levels become degenerate, this square root point with divergent slope, then at that point, these inner product between the eigenstates actually approach SU1. That's the key signature of an exceptional point, in fact, that the eigenvectors coalesce. Now in classical system, accessing eigenvectors is difficult, if not impossible, depending on the system, uh, because those eigenvectors basically correspond to steady state of a classical system, basically, okay? In the quantum case, you can access these eigenvectors. And so what is shown here on the right bottom column, actually what we get is that what is plotted here is the inner product of the eigenstates as a function of J. And what is shown here is that the eigenstate in a product actually starts out with very small value 0.2 here, increases to one as we approach the exceptional point, which in this case is shown by the boundary between the pink and the blue regions, and then dies off again, okay? So this dashed line is the sort of theoretical prediction, the dotted are the experimental data points. And this fact that you can literally access EP is something uh, or sort of demonstrate it by looking at inner product uh, of the eigenstates is one of the things which is possible in a you know, minimal qubit platform. Okay. All right, so now once we have this system, then we can do a lot of things because now you have a minimal quantum system uh, which has a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian basically, okay? All right, so now the next step 
that I want to tell you about uh, is uh, how do we look at sort of you know these complex energies and uh, what interesting things that happen when you start wandering the Riemann sheets, which actually represents the complex energies of this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. So for the, for the following part, I'm going to consider the Hamiltonian, which is of this form. So I should point out this is when delta is not zero, it is not PT symmetric. Uh, it had generally complex eigenvalues. So it's given by J sigma X, I gamma over two times sigma Z. But I also have a detuned Rabi drive that is applied in this qubit submanifold. And therefore, there is also a detuning part, which is there. And in a single qubit, uh, both J as well as the detuning can be varied dynamically. You can change it on the fly while the qubit is itself evolving. And uh, just to be sort of, you know, uh, to give you context, all of these measurements for this single qubit platform happen on microsecond time scale. So in other words, the, the, the quantities J, uh, the decay rates gamma and delta are all megahertz range. And the actual experimental trial for one trial uh, happens on sort of time scales, which are microseconds, basically, maybe two microseconds, maybe three, although that's pushing it. And because it is for such a short period of time, you can literally do a million experiments to get statistics for the data that you are then going to uh, sort of, you know, uh, use for these cases, okay? Right. So what is, so this one is an example of topological quantum state control when you wander these Riemann sheets in the vicinity of the exceptional points. And if you want details, they are in this recent PRL, okay? So what's the idea here? If I look at this Riemann sheets picture, which is what is shown here, this is a Riemann sheet uh, for one energy level, that's the blue, and the yellow one, which is the other energy level, the two axes are J here and uh, delta, the detuning here, okay? So when delta is zero, you can see sort of a, a, a tiny line, which is where the energy levels continue to remain real, basically, okay? And along this plane, at delta equals zero plane, is where the energy levels are going to be real. They are initially the real part of the eigenvalues, if you wish, okay? And the key part here is that, let's say I start with a blue sheet. Now, if I go, if I do a wandering around in the blue sheet, if I move around in this blue sheet, take up this big circle like this, and if I did that slow variation of delta and J, such that I came around in a circle that's shown down here, you know, in the parameter space, if I went around this uh, parameter space and carried out a loop, then what happens? Now you can imagine if I went around here, made a really big circle, I just stay on the blue loop, nothing really interesting happens. But if I am wandering around and sort of make a circle such that I came down through this gap between the two EPs, then as I come around this branch cut, I will go over to the other sheet, which means when I complete one circle in the parameter space, I have not come back to the original state modulo phase factor, which could be like Berry phase and, or geometric phase, but instead actually I have started out and gone through a circle in the parameter space and I have mode switched. I have switched from one eigenstate to the other eigenstate, okay? While just slowly going around the parameter space, that is all. Now this kind of a mode switch was observed in the classical systems basically where there is large number of quanta. But this one is you're actually taking a quantum state and seeing its evolution as you change the parameters of your Hamiltonian slowly. If it was a Hermitian Hamiltonian and you did this slowly, then all you can sort of expect to get at the end is the same density matrix, or in other words, all you can expect to get is a geometrical phase factor in addition to the dynamical phase factor, but that's it. Here, when you do this process, then you start out with one state, you know, let's say a state which is psi plus, and you end up in another state, okay? Uh, all this is shown in the tomography data that is shown in this panel over here. So X, Y, Z, these are the three tomography components of this qubit measured as a function of time. When you carry out one of these uh, encircling of the exceptional point. We starting out with a state which is pointing along minus x axis, which is why x corresponds to minus one in here, okay? 
And as a function of time, where time is varying over about 1.5 microseconds, you see in this panel, you keep measuring. So you start out with a state which is very close to minus x. So you have, you know, the x component of it is minus one, the y and the z components are zero, that's fine. And what is shown here are these measured data uh, along with sort of, you know, theoretical predictions, which are dashed lines. But is basically what you're doing is you started out with this state, which is close to minus one or close to minus x. And as time went on, if you carried out this circle in the parameter space, so you came back to the same Hamiltonian, Yet, as you go across, you see that your state minus x has changed to a state plus x. And this is why we call it topological quantum state control, because it's a quantum state control. It's a modality to change from one state to the other. And this is being done by just covering a closed loop in the parameter space, basically. Okay. <laughs> now, this is uh, so that's what happens when you went out this way. On the other hand, if you did the same process in the other direction, this is chiral though. So in other words, which sense you go in matters. And so if you did the same process, but in the anti-clockwise direction, you started out with minus one, it sort of starts to, seems to climb, but eventually it just washes out basically. Okay. So in other words, this asymmetry that you get or this chiral sort of state switch that you get uh, is a new way to control quantum states basically. Okay. Now, this process was done where the period for doing this was fairly large. Okay. And when I say fairly large, uh, I mean, it was of the order of a few microseconds. Basically, in this case, you know, the, 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 you know it was maybe 1.2 microsecond or 1.5 microseconds or something like that. Okay. And so that's a slow process. And we expected this more switch to happen uh, because, uh, you know, this Riemann sheet picture is nice. On the other hand, if you did this process faster, then you expect that there will be non-Hermitian dynamics. It will be combined with also Floquet dynamics because now the, the sort of, you know, the rate of sweeping is not very large, basically. And indeed we find uh, and experimentally measure uh, that you can undergo this mode switch, even if you are not going through this exceptional point, so what if I, I would like you to just sort of, you know, uh, focus on this panel, which is panel B here. What is showing here is uh, the mode switch probability, basically, as a function of the, the, the period, essentially, okay, right. Uh, and <laughs> what is shown here is that if I started out with, you know, so this is sort of mode switch probability, deep blue being mode switch probability of becoming close to one. So this sort of going from here to there, right? Okay. Now what it says is if you have sort of, if you're doing certain type of this particular circle in the parameter space, if you did it slowly, uh, then you have very high mode switch probability basically. But then if you start to do it fast, then you find that at some val specific values of mode switch frequencies or periods, uh, that probability suddenly drops to zero instead of, you know, it's, it's close to one here and suddenly it drops to zero. And we can explain these features by looking at the corresponding Floquet problem, basically. And so that gives rise to sort of another, you know, dimension to play with, which is non-Hermitian Floquet problems that we have investigated extensively. Okay. So these are two uh, models that, or these are sort of two cases that you can, study where you have a genuine non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which is investigating basically, or sort of genuine non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which is realized in a single quantum device in a minimal quantum system, okay? Uh, next, what I want to tell you about uh, is how we look at these kind of exceptional points, not just in the non-Hermitian dynamics, but also in the Lindblad dynamics. I mentioned at the beginning of the, this talk, and let me go back here, that this equation also stands for sort of Lindblad equation where this would be a density matrix, this would be a Lindblad super operator. And if I take that approach, then this Lindblad super operator is actually not Hermitian. And so there are some consequences by which you can approach exceptional points, even in the Lindblad dynamics. So I wanna tell you about that and having done that in a signal superconducting cube. Uh, but before I do that, uh, let me get an, an idea on how much time uh, I have. 
organizers could you tell me how much more time i have yeah i, I think uh, you have 10 more minutes 10 more minutes okay all right okay, okay good i take maybe 5 and then you know leave the rest for questions if there are any all right very good so now what i want to tell you about is uh investigating dynamics which has exceptional points like i mentioned these exceptional points are very interesting uh, because they are degeneracies, they give enhanced sensitivity because of this square root behavior that I mentioned, as well as, as we have seen here, these exceptional points are interesting because when you go around them, then you get a uh, ability to go from one quantum state to another quantum state while doing this process, basically, where you have completed a loop in the parameter space. So this is a, a, a major deviation from what we know and Hermitian quantum mechanics, where uh, this sort of, you know, just undergoing a loop in a parameter space gives rise to at most a Berry phase or some kind of geometric phase. In non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, undergoing a loop in the parameter space may not bring you back to your original eigenstate. In fact, it might switch you out to a completely different eigenstate, basically, okay? And so this part is, is <laughs> something which is uh, this kind of control as well as the sensitivity in your exceptional point makes you sort of wonder whether you could utilize the exceptional points that also arise in just Lindblad dynamics. So now I'm going to tell you about how we do that uh, in, again, the same platform, okay, right. And so the first example that I want to tell you is the following. Once again, I am going to consider the same dissipative non-Hermitian qubit that I mentioned to you about. Uh, it starts off with three level system or a, a Q trit, if you wish, where the decay rate from the excited to the ground state is something that we have made high relative to this decay rate, okay? And the two other levels, which are in this drop, uh, the F and the G levels, they are coupled by a rabbi drive, which is detuned. So J sigma X delta sigma Z, okay? And then uh, this part where I've shown this detector with an X around it basically says that we take this qubit and only look at it in the post-selected manifold. Only look at it when this decay is not happening. That's fine. But then uh, this is not the full description because in reality, there is also some decay which is happening within this sub-manifold itself, F and G, F and E. We can reduce this decay rate called gamma F. We can make it smaller, uh, but it's not gone. And in fact, we can make it large too, uh, because these decay rates or the dissipator strengths are tunable in an artificial atom like this, okay? Uh, so we consider this system where we do look at the effect of this decay by detecting this particular uh, sort of, you know, quantum jump to the environment, okay? And so we have two options, uh, in other words, to approach exceptional points. Like I mentioned, one is where you generate a non Hermitian Hamiltonian, that's this picture. And you do this by post selection, post selection only on the cases where the qubit hasn't decayed. Now, of course, because this, what happens because of post selection is that you have an exponentially decaying time data set because, you know, at time t equals zero, if you started from this excited state or maybe this state, maybe the qubit doesn't decay. But as time becomes longer and longer relative to gamma, basically, uh, or one over gamma, more precisely, uh, as time becomes longer, the number of trials where the qubit has not decayed is going to shrink exponentially. And so that puts a limit on how much longer uh, or how much of a time evolution can you simulate? Because you know you might be able to stimulate, simulate this up to uh, half a microsecond, yeah you know, one microsecond, okay. 10 microseconds with this system, you cannot do because the number of trials that would be needed to get some sort of, you know, no quantum jump terms, basically, is going to grow exponentially, okay? And so <laughs> the limitation on simulating non-Hermitian Hamiltonian then is essentially the problem that the, the data set on which this works is become exponentially smaller with time. Now with Lindblad, when we're looking at the entire dynamics of the density matrix, then there is no post-selection. That's fine, because you're just looking at the density matrix. Okay. <clears throat> but on the other hand, because Lindblad gives rise to sort of approach to a steady state, you know, which may not be ground state, but approach to some steady state, 
uh, that means you are studying the approach to steady state or you are studying the transient or decaying signal. Okay. And indeed, as it turns out, uh, this decay to the steady state is fastest at the exceptional point because exceptional points really correspond to sort of, you know, the critically damped system in the language of uh, our sort of simple harmonic oscillator or some typical prototypical model. Okay. So in other words, if you are in the vicinity of exceptional points, then you are studying decaying signals which are decaying really fast. Okay. And so either approaches allows you to access exceptional points, but there is no free lunch, in other words. Uh, even if you are using Lindbergh approach or whether you are using non-Hermitian Hamiltonian approach, in both cases, there is a limit to what length of time can you simulate this non-Hermitian dynamics. There are ways to get around this through other approaches called unitary dilation and so on, but I'm not going to go over it uh, this time around. Okay. All right, so you could, you could study this dynamics in this uh, qubit subspace, uh, get properties to look at you know, how the dynamics happens. It's under damped initially over here. It starts to become sort of critically damped. And then this one is over damped behavior. You could from this extract out sort of you know, the decay constants as a function of the, the J value, which is the tunable parameter here and observe the, the exceptional points and things like that. So there is room to sort of you know, look at a number of phenomena here. Uh, but we have to sort of remember that whether you are doing it Lindblad or non-Hermitian, it does have limitations. Okay. So finally, I want to tell you about uh, some other piece of work, which is again, exploring Lindblad EPs, but going beyond uh, what I talked about earlier. And this is uh, another PRL uh, over here. Uh, but the basic idea is simple. The basic idea is you look at a single dissipative qubit. Okay. So a single qubit, not post-selected, so just ground state level, excited state level, coupled by rabbi drive detuning and some decay within this, where there might be dissipations or there will be dissipators which are given by gamma E and gamma, uh, you know, gamma phi. So if I look at this qubit dynamics, then this qubit dynamics on the block sphere is represented by some equations of motion like this, where you know, X, Y, Z are the block uh, projections basically. And the generator of this is not Hermitian or not anti-Hermitian, okay? which means this is a three by three non-Hermitian matrix, which can have exceptional points of order two and three, depending on what the parameters in the system are. Okay? And we are able to sort of study the dynamics in this parameter space at exceptional points of order two or exceptional points of order three, basically, uh, by sitting at appropriate places. So here is a short picture of carrying out this process where you vary the parameters uh, cyclically and look at how the density matrix of the system changes. So not the state, but the density matrix now because the eigenstates of Lindblad are density matrices. So how this density matrix switch from one state or one manifold to the other can be carried out. And we find that once again, you can sort of show that this, even in this case, you can get density matrix mode switch just as you got it for the state levels. There's a lot of information here, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, to not do that basically. Okay. Uh, all right, so I want to uh, end here basically. Okay. Uh, so the outlook that I want to tell you about, or what I want to mention is really that coupling time reverse systems gives rise to non-hermeticities, which have very interesting properties. And this can be done in classical systems, it can be done in quantum systems. And I really got into this because of these high school students. So in India's, I guess, curriculum, students who are in 10th, 11th or 12th grade. Uh, these kids wanted to study, do some research projects basically. Uh, and you know, matrices which are non-Hermitian, but two by two, three by three, or you know, some general N by N which are addressable using uh, MATLAB or Mathematica meant that there was a slew of problems that we could study, which were very simple to look at, but represented some really deep physics because it could be realized across a variety of platforms. And so, uh, you know, these are all the students who have helped me over the last 10 years get into this subject, starting from sort of, you know, some really simple calculation, one of which was actually uh, portrayed on 60 Minutes uh, news program because it was done by uh, this young kid who at that time was about 12 years old. 
uh, well, he was a child prodigy, uh, to you know a number of other sort of papers which basically just tell us more and more about that this is a good playground for uh, actually really uh, getting students into uh, the topic of quantum information or quantum sciences, because in the end, all of this is two by two or four by four matrices. So if you keep students away from Schrodinger equation and just keep them interested in two by two and four by four matrices uh, uh, that are that basically you know represent universal get set, then uh, there's a lot of room to also engage uh, students in original research. Uh, so I think with that, I will stop. Uh, okay. uh, thank you, Professor, for a very interesting talk, very motivating talk. Uh, may I request you to answer some of the questions in the chat box, if you can? Uh, yes, I will. So I think I answered some of them during my talk, but let me now go in the reverse chronological order from the ones that I have not answered. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, Chandramani has questions regarding how is this topological and you know the Riemann sheet is a surface different functions uh, than uh, then how the, are the axes determined. Okay, all right. So uh, the, the the short answer to how this is topological is really regarding whether the mode switch in the adiabatic limit when you go around from here to there happens. Uh, when the curve encloses the exceptional point or not, or in other words, whether the winding number is zero or one. So when you take this parameter curve uh, and calculate the winding number on the Riemann sheet associated with it, the more, this is why we call it topological because even if, whether we took a curve which is like that, or whether we take some other deformed curve in here, as long as it encloses the EP, we will get the same answer. If it does not enclose the EP in certain limit, we'll get the same answer. Okay, so that's sort of the answer for that. Uh, Riemann sheet is a surface with different functions. Then how are these axes determined? The axes for the Riemann sheets in this case are determined by what are experimentally tunable parameters, basically. Okay, so the Hamiltonian model is just given by this as usual, but in variety of experiments, depending on the platform, you will have different parameters which are tunable or not. For example, in the experiments that were done in with, with uh, systems which are uh, optical or acoustic systems, usually you find that the J parameter is constant and gamma and delta are the ones which are typically varied. That is done in the classical uh, models uh, because those are the parameters which are easily tunable. But that's how it is sort of done. Uh, there is a question regarding what are essential, necessary and sufficient condition of a system to be a non-Hermitian system. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this question means. Uh, I think that in, in our case, or basically the way we are studying non-Hermeticity uh, and sort of relevant ideas is where a system, if it is described by a equation of motion that I had mentioned earlier, you know, I delta of something is equal to B times something, uh, then, a non-Hermitian system is pretty much defined by this B matrix not being Dirac Hermitian. And once again, we are using sort of the Dirac inner product as the primary inner product because that is the one which uh, corresponds to experiments. Yeah. Uh, all right, are there any other questions which I have missed? You know, this inner product thing, I remember now, you explained to me last year, so I'm not going to ask anyone more time, so. Okay, all right, yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, the left-right inner product of projection, uh, which develops a self-consistent unitary evolution theory for self-adjoint, but not, uh, you know, Hermitian Hamiltonians, uh, it's just that the left-right overlap is not what Bond approximation is, basically, in some sense, yeah. So wonderful talk, you know, very nice and, uh, you know, telling us how to use undergraduate students and high school students more effectively, you know. So. Well, I, I am happy to, I, I mean, one of my interests actually on this front, if there are experimentalists in the, in the audience, is to realize this across multiple platforms. And so I am always in search of, you know, new platforms, whatever platform you have, classical or quantum in terms of experiments. We can, because of the generality of this picture, we can probably find 
phenomena which are related to exceptional points in your system. Okay. And so I am very much interested in, in that. And, and, and if there are people who are interested in this, uh, then I, I look forward to having more detailed conversations with you, basically. Um, thank you, Professor, for a very nice uh, discussion on the subject. And uh, over to the over to the organizers if there are any announcements, any comments. No, no, no. We are thankful to you guys for a very, you know, really wonderful talk, and uh, you know, like last time also. So let's hope that some effective collaboration develops. Last time, Sorin and you had a good conversation and a good collaboration came out. So uh, yes, that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, last yeah. time I think it was at this meeting that I met Saurin, and that is something that has been going strong well. So I look forward to hearing from from people if if uh, they are interested.